On September 24, 2002, Microsoft announced that they had purchased Rare for $375 million, turning the studio into a first-party developer for the Xbox. This was a shock to Rare fans and the gaming press, especially after Rare's string of successful games for the Nintendo 64, and it raised the question, why didn't Nintendo just buy Rare outright? Nintendo owned a 49% stake in the company, but even after keeping Rare under their wing for so long, the company wasn't investing in them any further, so Rare started looking for buyers. They were approached by Activision and Microsoft, and Rare initially sided with Activision. But after negotiations fell through for unknown reasons, Microsoft came in with a counteroffer that Rare accepted. This acquisition led to a handful of Xbox and Xbox 360 games, including Grabbed by the Ghoulies, Conquer Live and Reloaded, Cameo Elements of Power, and Viva Pinata. However, Banjo and Kazooie wouldn't make the transition to the Xbox family until 2008, and there would be two more games released in the meantime, both still on Nintendo hardware. This time, however, the bear and bird would be on the go. When you had a successful platforming franchise in the late 80s, 90s, and early 2000s, then two things are basically guaranteed to happen. A handheld platformer and a racing spinoff. And Banjo is no exception, since the next two games in the series, Banjo-Kazooie Grunty's Revenge and Banjo Pilot, followed this trend. Today we're looking at Grunty's Revenge, which has roots in a shelved Game Boy Color game that Rare started designing after Banjo-Kazooie. That game, known as Banjo-Kazooie Grunty's Curse, began development in 1999 as a side project to accompany Banjo-Tooie. And it seems like it would have been a 2D platformer with the same collection-based gameplay of the Nintendo 64 games. While Rare made considerable progress in its initial design, development stalled in late 1999 and wouldn't restart until the release of the Game Boy Advance in 2001. Eventually, the project, renamed Banjo-Kazooie Grunty's Revenge, was released in North America on September 12, 2003. If you're wondering why Rare was able to create games for the GBA even after being bought by Microsoft, the reason is actually pretty simple. Microsoft has never released a handheld console, and therefore had no competition against the Game Boy Advance. And since Grunty's Revenge was too far in development to change consoles, Microsoft allowed Rare to finish up the game for the GBA. Microsoft didn't publish the game though, instead THQ partnered with Rare to release both Grunty's Revenge and Banjo Pilot. Grunty's Revenge is often regarded as an inferior and unessential Banjo game, mainly because it's stuck on a handheld system and isn't considered a main series entry. But is the game really worthy of that kind of criticism? It obviously can't reach the scale of the N64 games because it's on a console that's far less technically capable, but is the game itself still any good? Well, let's find out. Grunty's Revenge takes place two months after Banjo-Kazooie, with Gruntilda still stuck under that boulder and Klungo still trying to rescue her. Klungo builds a robotic body that allows Grunty's spirit to escape her physical body and inhabit this new one, turning her into Mecha Grunty. She kidnaps Kazooie and travels back in time to prevent Banjo and Kazooie from ever meeting, which would stop the events of Banjo-Kazooie from happening and restore Gruntilda to her former self. Banjo and Mumbo Jumbo narrowly miss Mecha Grunty before she disappears, so Mumbo uses his own magic to send Banjo back to the past, where he encounters Bazai the Mole, Bottle's distant relative, and the past version of Mumbo, who both help Banjo on his quest. Banjo journeys through the past version of Spiral Mountain, eventually rescuing Kazooie and duking it out with Klungo and Mecha Grunty. So yes, it's a time travel story that conveniently has no canonical effects on the Banjo timeline. Which is kind of expected since this is a handheld game and therefore has the stigma, or blessing depending on how you look at it, of not being a main series Banjo game. The events of Grunty's Revenge are never referenced in future games, and a lot of Banjo fans don't even consider this game canon. This is clearly its own story that isn't trying to advance the Banjo mythos, and for a simple platformer, it does its job fine. Where the narrative really lacks is the writing, especially in comparison to the N64 games. I'll give Rare credit for trying to preserve the spirit of the dialogue from Kazooie and Tooie, but most of the time, it just falls flat. 
the snappy, cynical writing of Tui is severely muted, and whenever it tries to be funny, it either has no impact or is painful to read. This game is a side project and you need to manage your expectations accordingly, but this was especially noticeable to me after having just played Kazooie and Tui. Part of this problem is the characters, who all just blend together after a while. Many characters have copy and pasted sprites and voices, and I get that they don't have a lot of memory to work with, but it means talking to people gets repetitive. The characters with unique designs are more interesting, but because the writing is so generic, they aren't able to stick out that much from the rest. Considering the time travel story, you might think you'd encounter past versions of other Banjo-Kazooie characters, but this only happens once. Since you meet the child version of Captain Blubber, a pirate hippo who is in both Banjo-Kazooie and Tui. This feels like a missed opportunity, and it would have been cool to see what some of those characters were doing before Banjo met them. But even though the narrative and characters aren't as good as the N64 titles, I can excuse it because this is a platformer on a handheld system. And expecting the same level of care and attention to the story and writing as the console games is being unfair. The gameplay is more important here anyway, so let's talk about that. Grunty's Revenge, as you might expect, takes the platforming gameplay of the N64 games and changes it up a bit to make it fit on the GBA. Instead of being a full 3D platformer, the game has an overhead perspective that allows for movement in eight directions. Surprisingly, the eight directional movement isn't a hindrance for just getting around, it only becomes a problem for certain moves, which we'll talk about in a bit. It's slower paced than Kazooie and Tui, but the design makes platforming more forgiving. Which makes sense, because it's harder to be precise in an overhead perspective where you can't control the camera. Jumping feels pretty good, and you can adjust your direction in the air, so while movement is more rigid, you still have solid maneuverability. This control scheme was a nice compromise to maintain the Banjo game feel on a system that can't handle full 3D on the level of the N64, and playing in this new perspective isn't half bad. But that's just talking about the basics, because as tradition dictates, you'll learn a bunch of abilities as you play. Unfortunately, Banjo has forgotten all of his moves from Kazooie and Tui, although I guess at this point he wouldn't have known the Tui moves at all yet? Anyway, you'll visit Bazai and trade the proper amount of notes to relearn your old abilities. You might think having to relearn everything is dumb, and for Banjo fans it does feel redundant. But considering you're dealing with an entirely new console and perspective here, it makes sense that the game has to teach you how these moves work with these new controls. Climbing, rolling, the flap flip, the feathery flap, the talon trot, the ratatat wrap, the shock jump pads, and the bell drill all return and work exactly as they did before. The pack whack, however, which is the first move you learn, is now a simple forward facing attack, rather than a 360 degree swinging attack as it was in Tui. My favorite part is that you can still use the pack whack even after you rescue Kazooie, so Banjo's just slamming Kazooie into the ground. Although, I guess that's nothing new. Banjo can still swim, but he can't dive underwater except for specifically marked sections. Which takes him to an underwater area where he can swim around and control his depth by pressing the A button. But I swear they forgot about this halfway through development, since after the second world, I don't remember there being any underwater areas. The Wonder Wing is back, but you can't use it wherever you want anymore. Instead, you need to use these Wonder Wing pads to activate the move. This is a pretty lame change, since it reduces the Wonder Wing to an ability that's only used to collect specific items rather than being a helpful way to deal with enemies. Finally, Egg Firing returns, but it takes on a new form which the game calls the Egg Spit. This is basically the Briegel Blaster without the first person view, as Kazooie shoots out eggs while Banjo holds her, allowing him to still move around and jump. Aiming can be pretty difficult though, because the 8 directional movement restricts your ability to fire precisely without shuffling around to adjust your position. Eggs are pretty useless in this game because every other attack is better for fighting enemies. And the only real use for them is shooting these egg tolls, which require a certain amount of a specific egg type to be activated. There are four types of eggs in Grunty's Revenge, the normal blue eggs, the ice eggs, the fire eggs, and the all new battery eggs which are eggs that create an electric shock and, from what I can tell, are not helpful in combat. This moveset is a mixed bag. A lot of moves did not translate well or seem to be here simply because they're memorable. 
And for a platformer on a console with fewer buttons than the N64, the amount of moves is a little high. Rare could have trimmed down the moveset to focus more on platforming and it would have worked better, but on the whole, these moves still feel okay. Once again, collectibles are your main objective, though there aren't nearly as many. Just like before, there are 10 Jiggies in each level and they unlock new worlds when you bring them to Jiggy Wiggy's temple. Rather than completing a puzzle, you just walk up to this crystal jiggy altar and the next world opens. It's as simple as that. Collecting jiggies is more balanced between platforming, puzzle solving, and mini games. There are three kinds of mini games a slide game where you race down a giant slide while dodging obstacles, a fishing game where you reel in objects by building up power and releasing at the right time and a bumper car style game where you battle other characters in a fiend vehicle while completing another objective. The mini games are aesthetically different depending on the world and the objectives are also varied, but no matter what, these mini games are not very interesting. You'll fight Klungo or Grunty in each world, which grants you a Jiggy and a Mumbo token. Klungo is more or less the same as he was in Banjo-Tooie, using potions to assist himself and hurt Banjo, and he's just as easy to take down. Mecha Grunty has a bunch of attacks, but they're fairly telegraphed and shouldn't cause you too much trouble, though she has quite a bit of health in later fights. These boss fights are basically just waiting for an opening in the boss's defenses and attacking them, and they get repetitive pretty quickly. Notes are used to purchase abilities, and they come either individually or in packs of five. The placement of these notes is a little weird. They're often placed in compact sections of a screen instead of being spread out, which makes exploring for notes a bit of a chore. The Jinjos are back, and the games return to the Banjo-Kazooie system where collecting five Jinjos in a level will grant you a Jiggy. However, instead of earning the Jiggy immediately, you need to visit the Jinjo Oracle, this giant Jinjo statue, in each world to collect the Jiggy. The Jinjo Oracle gives you hints for each Jinjo you find, but the process of traveling back and forth to the statue to get these hints is not worth it most of the time. There are two empty honeycomb pieces, this time called hollow honeycombs, in each world, and you'll still need to bring them to Honey Bee on Spiral Mountain to receive the extra health. Finally, as I mentioned earlier, Mumbo tokens return, and you gain one after beating a boss. If you bring a token to Mumbo, you'll unlock a new transformation, of which there are four. The mouse, which can fit in small spaces and chew on things with its teeth. The candle, which can set objects on fire and light dark areas. The octopus, which improves your swimming abilities. And the tank, which can't jump but shoots powerful cannonballs at enemies. Once again, these transformations are puzzle exclusive, except for the octopus and maybe the mouse, they're only useful for collecting certain items. However, once you unlock a transformation, you can use it in any level you want, rather than having them restricted to one world. I like that idea, as it makes for more interesting level design, and because there are only four transformations, it isn't overwhelming. The number of required Jiggies isn't as strict as Banjo-Kazooie, but it's definitely tighter than it was in Tui. You'll need 50 of the 60 Jiggies to unlock Grunty's castle, and because of how the game is laid out, you'll need to visit each world before opening the final area. Unlike in Tui, where if you collect enough stuff, you could completely skip a world and still beat the game if you wanted. Grunty's Revenge is a much smaller adventure, and it'll only take you a couple of hours to beat, even if you go for 100%. And being a smaller adventure, there are only five worlds this time around, plus Spiral Mountain, which acts as the hub world. Spiral Mountain isn't too big, and the layout is easy to memorize, especially if you explore the world for jiggies and notes. The first level, Cliff Farm, is a grassland level with, as the name suggests, a farm setting. Aside from the farm area, which takes up a decent chunk of the world, there's not a lot that separates it from a typical grass level, but I guess it's a decent world. Regal Beach, the second level, is a seaside world where Banjo rescues Kazooie and the rest of her Briegel companions from Grunty's imprisonment. This world is much better, mostly because getting Kazooie back makes exploring the level more fun, and the platforming here is pretty enjoyable. Then we have Bad Magic Bayou, a swamp level that also features a haunted house and is another fun level. While I'm not a fan of the color scheme, the dangerous swamp water means navigating is more tough, and exploring the haunted house is definitely a highlight. Spiller's Harbor is up next, which features a rundown waterside town, sorta of like a dilapidated Jolly Rogers Lagoon. 
This is where the game starts to get more challenging. A lot of the jiggies here involve short time limits or dangerous platforming. And gathering every single item is definitely more annoying than in other worlds. The final level, Freezing Furnace, is a winter wasteland that also hosts a lava fiend sub-area, the still under construction Grunty Industries. The snowy overworld is decent enough, but the level topography can get in the way of platforming when you're in the lower areas. But the Grunty Industries area is the most difficult part of the entire game, with plenty of enemies and lava to deal with. Once you've collected enough jiggies, you enter Grunty's castle, where Banjo fights Klungo and Mecha Grunty before facing the most daunting and grueling challenge yet. A quiz show. Though honestly, it isn't even worth talking about this time. It's just basic questions and playing the occasional minigame, and only takes about a minute to complete. Once you finish the final fight against Mecha Grunty, her mechanical skeleton is destroyed and her spirit flies back to her body underneath the rock. But not before she tells Klungo to get help from her sisters, leading to the events of Banjo-Tooie. While the game's worlds come nowhere close to those of Kazooie and Tui, and their theming isn't anything special, most of them are fun to explore, and they're designed well around the isometric camera. Grunty's Revenge is pretty easy if you just want to beat the game. The only real challenge comes from trying to collect all the items. And usually this difficulty is less satisfying and more irritating. Once again, there's no lives in this game, so you can die as many times as you want without losing progress, but if you play well enough, you shouldn't die that often. In terms of graphics, Grunty's Revenge looks pretty good for the GBA. The character and enemy sprites preserve the Banjo graphic style while being restricted to 2D artwork, and the environments have bright colors that are pleasant to look at. The isometric view can sometimes get in the way of platforming, though. It can be difficult to determine the distance between objects, which is a problem shared with a lot of isometric platformers. And in a few instances, collectibles are completely obscured by an object or part of the terrain, which doesn't happen that often, but is still frustrating. Grant Kirkhope did not return to write the music, and the lack of his signature style is noticeable, but although this soundtrack isn't anything special, the music isn't that bad. Most of the compositions do a fair job emulating a banjo soundtrack, though there are some songs that do not sound like Banjo-Kazooie at all, like Bad Magic Bayou's theme. But there's some legitimately good songs, and they definitely fit the areas they play in. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to figure out who the composer for this game was, which is a shame because I like to credit music directors for their work. The credits don't specify the jobs of each developer, and only lists them by first initial and last name as the GBA team. I believe that Jamie Hughes created this soundtrack because he helped compose music for Banjo Pilot, but I wasn't able to confirm this. Some sources claim that Robin Beanland, who also composed music for Banjo Pilot, as well as Killer Instinct, Conker's Bad Fur Day, and Sea of Thieves also worked on this soundtrack. But his name isn't listed in the credits, so this probably isn't true. Now, I've talked about the GBA game for this video, but there is another version of Grunty's Revenge that was released for cell phones. I'm not making this up. Banjo-Kazooie Grunty's Revenge was ported to mobile devices in 2004, developed by Russian company Cybico and published by Infusio. This version has some pretty incredible features, such as severely condensed level design, lower graphic fidelity considering this had to fit on a 2004-era phone, Music that's just a bunch of MIDI versions of the Grunty's Revenge soundtrack that literally stops when any other sound effect plays. Much fewer moves than the GBA version, not to mention no transformations. And a camera that's pulled back way too far from the action. I'm sure I don't need to say this, but this port is inferior in just about every department. And I guess the only thing that's cool about it is the fact that it's the only Banjo-Kazooie mobile game. Although that's not even true, because there was another Banjo game released on mobile devices in 2005, Banjo-Kazooie Grunty's Revenge Missions. All this game is, is the mini-games from Grunty's Revenge in one package, and that's it. I couldn't even find footage of this game to show you guys, that's how obscure this one is. Maybe Banjo-Kazooie Nuts and Bolts is the most despised Banjo game, but Grunty's Revenge Mobile is undoubtedly the worst one. It's kind of a novel idea, but that's all it has going for it. But if we're talking about the GBA version of Grunty's Revenge, it's a pretty decent game. 
It makes a commendable attempt to capture the spirit of the Nintendo 64 classics while adjusting for the limited hardware, and for the most part, it succeeds. The game isn't very hard, the moveset is unnecessarily large, and the story is non-existent, but it controls great, the world design is pretty good, and it makes the transition from Banjo-Kazooie and Banjo-Tooie fairly well. It's clear that there was still effort placed into creating this game, which I think is admirable considering this is a smaller side project and therefore not a priority for Rare. I wouldn't classify it as an essential game, and if you didn't enjoy the N64 titles, you probably won't enjoy this one. But if you're a Banjo fan, or are just looking for a good platformer on the Game Boy Advance, you could do a lot worse than Grunty's Revenge. Just, uh, avoid the mobile version at all costs. Banjo and Kazooie's handheld adventures aren't over, however, as before they made their big return to consoles, the Baron Bird would take to the skies once again. This time, for a racing game.